Hello and welcome to Navigating Change from Tie the Link. My name is Pete Wright. Thanks for downloading. What you're about to hear is part three of the conversation we had between Howard Teibel and John Elder, VP of Administration for Berklee College of Music in Boston on strategic planning in higher education. If you missed parts one and two, make sure to visit tybelink.com slash podcast and get caught up and subscribe to the show. We'll be posting the final part of our conversation with John in the coming week. Without further ado, I'm thrilled to present our conversation with John Eldert and Howard Teibel on Building Your Vision 2020. Well, the thought is that we're in the same business pretty much the same way. So we have a common data framework, a common management framework. And so we'd be much more efficient and probably much more effective to share this common vocabulary, the common metrics. And then every institution can play on that game board as befits their own you know, sense of what they think is possible or appropriate given their mission. But at least we wouldn't be fooling around while other folks are very purposeful. And right now it feels to me like our management processes are kind of fooling around, not using the tools that are available to us. Yeah. And so with today's ERP systems and the, institu the institutional research data framework, so we have the ability to fairly quickly put together a, a, a data framework at the strategic and the tactical and the implementation layer that is probably 80, 90 percent representative of all institutions and it could be done in a very short period of time, in which case then everyone would be playing with a much fuller array of understanding and a much higher beginning point and then the lost time and energy that is involved in recreating this stuff in an incomplete fashion time after time can go into much more effective decision making and much more successful outcomes and probably a much better collective competitive position. And, and I don't think U.S. education understands that it is really a collaborative sector I and mean, it's really one of the most dominant remaining industries in the United States that differentiates us from you know, other parts of the globe. And if we don't understand how important that difference is and really work to preserve it and to use the best management techniques we have at our disposal, most of which are happening in the for-profit sector, then we're foolish. I mean, we're dissipating an asset. Right. And like, like John says, I agree. We're playing around the edges on this, on this conversation. Although what's really interesting, I have not seen in my 23 years of working in the higher ed, in the last three, four years, uh, a pretty significant wake-up call is not necessarily driving people to this to this approach, but part of it is that the data is out there, but there isn't a approach for senior leaders and then for their people to follow. I mean, that's part of the disconnect right now. Is as John said, we know how to do strategic plans, we know how to do tactical plans, we've got the data out there. All the, uh, the stuff is out there. What we don't have yet is a way to step people through it. And I think that's the piece that John and I are continue to explore is to really make this reachable for people because it's not as far away as they think it is. No, it's a very, it's a very disciplined and systematic approach using what's out there. Right. That's the only difference. Right. And, and it's very learnable and it's very easily supported you know, with today's data systems. So when, when you go back and you say, well, what is the it we're talking about? The it is understanding clearly where we are now in the metrics that matter. It's understanding where we'd like to be with those metrics. It's understanding where others are with respect to those metrics, and that's the strengths and weaknesses analysis. It's understanding our context against other contexts, which is really the external trends analysis, the threats and opportunities. And then knowing the difference between where we are now and where we'd like to be or knowing what's happening now and what we think is going to be happening. It's the synthesis of ideas from across the campus about, oh, if I want to have that much more endowment per student or I want to have that much better a placement rate coming out of my medical program, then what do I have to do? And so this takes us to strategy. And so what is strategy? And I, and I defy you to go find a nice tidy description out there in the medical, I mean, out there in the uh, management literature. But what I think it is, as a practitioner, is nothing more than a coordinated set of activities, things we do that we think is going to take us from today's state to that desired future goal. Right. 
and it's a hypothesis. So in some sense, it's the scientific method at work here, which is something we're supposed to be really good at. It's, it's a guess. I think we do these things, then we'll make progress toward our goal. And then you get into now, you hit the, the dividing line with tactics, which is okay. I'm going to do 25 more admissions team visits in the Midwest with a focus on woodwinds, in Berkeley's case, or a focus on uh, nano students interested in nanotechnology, in MIT's case. And if I do those 25 visits in this four month period, the front end of the admissions cycle, I think that's going to improve our yield downstream. So the objectives are the 25 visits in the Midwest with a focus on these specialties. Yes. That's what an objective is. The goal is a different composition of a student class or a different right. level of preparedness. So goals and objectives are not the same thing. They're That's separated right. Right. by the hypothesis called strategy. See, and what's so interesting in, in continuing to listen and, and work with John is to, to see the value of the use of the language, whether whether it's right or wrong, but if we use the language in a consistent way, we have a much greater likelihood that we're going to be able to design milestones that make sense because we're all saying the same thing. I mean, that is the basis of the breakdown is that people are going into these conversations and it sounds good. And I've even been at the, I mean, I read some of the stuff that I write and I say, you know what? It's not as precise as it should be, or I'm being consistent. I use it one way in one capacity, another way in another, and then you multiply this times a group of 10 people, it, it gets blown out of the water. Well, what, what we miss in that, why any of this matters, I think, Howard, is that it's this hypothesis at the heart of it. If we aren't clear about what we're actually talking about, then we've lost the ability to look at what actually happened and go backwards through a logical chain of let us examine our assumptions. So those 25 visits actually didn't do a damn thing yeah. to our yield. Oh, then I've got to rethink my yeah. strategy. Well, see, so we're creating the, yeah. models of what of what is influencing what, and if we lose the, the um, details around that, then we've lost the ability to analyze and correct our actions. Yeah. You know, Pete, because this is such a uh, – because John talks about it as a rich and a complex environment, I think what makes it so increasing, so difficult for leaders in higher education is to find a way to cooperatively create systematic, systematic approaches. You know, institutional research mm -hmm. has a systematic approach. And you can see them making a lot of progress in uncovering and gathering data. But when you see people start a process, I mean, what, what I'm seeing is uh, leaders don't want to start this process because they don't know where to start. And what, as I've discussed with you, John, what you've done is you've started this process by saying, let's look at facilities and, and let's work this process in a holistic way through the whole facilities model and get that working to use that as a way of showing success in one area and then we'll show a success in another area. Because I think the listener here is going, this is all great, but I don't know where to start. That that was exactly my question. I'm sitting, if you could see me, I'm sitting here with the heel of my my hand against my forehead. The, the Because I, I I get it. As a matter of fact, I, I get it. I, I, I feel like there are a few things you said earlier, John, about it, just really translating the strategies and tactics. Uh, you know, the definition of those words really makes sense to me. But then I go all the way back up to the top of our discussion uh, about why it's so difficult translating monoline thinking to multi-line enterprises in, a, in higher ed. And that's where I think, how do you go to work every day? I mean, <laughs> aren't you pulling your hair out just trying to figure out how do you bring so many disparate lines of, of the organization into concert? Well, fortunately for all of us, there are a lot of really good people in this business. So if you were to get a bunch of enrollment management folks together, they would compile in the course of a working session probably an 80 or 90 percent congruent, similar depiction of what their enrollment strategy is. Whatever the beginning point and desired endpoint is for student student attributes. And it would consist of 
publications and web presence and visits and alumni uh, intervention in the local markets. So there's a great consistency implicitly in how a lot of the stuff is being done. It just isn't very well written down anywhere in, again, a common language. Similarly, you can talk to educators about educational outcomes. There's been a great deal of foundation work on depicting the desired outcomes from the math curriculum or the uh, physics curriculum or, or English curriculum. And so there's a lot of, a lot of um, very, very precise desired outcomes that are rubrics in a curricular sense. That's out there too, although it isn't shared. I mean, but it, the foundation share it, but the individual colleges are pretty opaque as to where they are relative to it. There's a great deal in the financial world of structure embedded in the financial statements around components of resources, whether it's the investment in plant or the investment in systems or the um, structure of, you know, of receivables and payables and all that kind of stuff. And, and so, again, it wouldn't take a lot of effort to construct a shared view of all that stuff. And, in fact, when you look at a lot of the work that FASB and GASB have done in the last several years in trying to align financial reporting and now also align financial reporting in the U.S. to financial reporting in other parts of the globe, they come up with frameworks that are much tighter than there were 15 or 20 years ago with more things required to be included. But also they've referred to something called intermediate measures of operations, which is terrific. They left it up to the industry to self-define it, except nobody really knows what the hell that means. Mm -hmm. And so we have an opportunity to tell them what it means in our terms. And so, again, everyone knows what they do really well, but they have no practice in communicating about it with each other to a great degree. That's right. And that's where, you know, I'll tell you about That's why it's not so hopeless. You know. I agree. And I, and I think the piece that, as I listen to John, that, that I think does need to happen more is this sense of we're in this together. And although we may compete in some capacities, in, in, in another way, we have so much to learn from each other. I can't tell you the number of projects I get involved in. And the first thing they're doing is, what's a peer institution we should research to learn how they did this? Everybody thinks they're behind the curve, when in fact, what they need to do is exactly what John's saying. You put your enrollment people together, you put your finance people together, and you collectively come up with a way of looking at this. And I think what you'll come away with if you're an institution that – uh, you're not doing this is a recognition that you're closer than you think. That's that's the first thing. The other dilemma, Pete, I think that, or the hurdle that you get over in pursuing this, is that people have to be willing to make this investment in the face of not seeing results immediately. And there's too much focus, especially from the senior levels. We have to see results now, and this is the process where collecting the data it does not produce the outcome. Collecting the data is the beginning, and that takes time and energy, and that means that people have to stop, be, stop doing busy work and focus on what they should be focused on. And I see that as an inherent problem across higher ed, is that people are not being directed to priorities. Well, it's funny, not funny, it's, it's fortunate that uh, here in the Boston area, there's an organization called the Boston Consortium, which has been in existence for about 15 years, and it's got 15 quite diverse but representative institutions, colleges and universities. And after 15 years, we finally have built up now the trust and a shared understanding of why it's okay to collaborate. So we're probably running 20 different communities of practice at different um, roles on campus. And the kinds of initiatives that are running right now with a long lead time to get started are uh, shared health management initiatives leading to a community health plan in the greater Boston area. Right now we've got, we've got 10 schools representing 40,000 lives collaborating on a medical database upon which plan design and intervention and education programs can be developed. So now we've got 10 schools collaborating on, on benefits design and implementation. We've got schools collaborating 
on uh, buying of insurance and adopting risk management techniques. I'm, I'm playing to your point about we don't have the resources. If we work together, That's right. we can create the resources out of today's budget and have money left over. Our procurement initiatives, something we've been working on for 15 years, finally showing fruit on mundane things like uh, plant MRO supplies and paper that we actually deliver to the printer, not to ourselves. So we tell our printers who we select independently, print, you know, print what we want, but use the paper we're going to tell you to use. I mean, stuff like that. So I think there's huge opportunity because those are down inside the level of tactics for the most part. It's not deciding what to do. Right. It's how to do it in a more efficient form. But it is freeing up resources. Then they can be redirected into investment in other enterprises and generally a higher level activity than the more mundane tactical activities. But what I, my guess is what you're not seeing is you're not seeing boards or trustees from different institutions coming together and having this kind of dialogue and building that kind of trust. Although I'm sure that they meet and they have a relationship or presidents from multiple institutions going, how can we better work together? They do if they're in the geographic area because I see consortiums beginning to pop up in different places. Yeah. But it's fundamentally, I think what you're saying is trust is the key here. Building that sense of trust that I'm going to get something out of it by giving. And, and we'll, be part and, of this bigger group. And we'll both be better off. And we'll both be better off. So that, that's the, I mean, there is, there is um, a generative aspect to this kind of collaboration. Thank you for joining us for this portion of our conversation with John Elder, Vice President of Administration from the Berkeley College of Music. For more of our conversation with John, please join us at tybalink.com slash podcast or subscribe to the show for free in the iTunes podcast directory. Just search for Navigating Change and you'll make sure you never miss an episode. Again, thanks, and we'll catch you next week on Navigating Change.